Thank you very much. Thank you for including me in the session. I am going to come at the uh, theme of powerful artifacts a little bit from the underground, so to speak. Um, my example is, uh, is an example of, of power that is denied and hidden away explicitly. It comes from the illicit production of small items in the context of the Ravensbrück prison camp. And I will discuss how these very small and often fragmented uh, traces and objects and even things created ex nihilo can be actively called upon to affect the daily lives of people, uh, in this case, incarcerated in an extremely controlled environment to support a sense of self among people whose humanity depend on them. So the ability for material traces, objects and art to trigger emotional mnemonic responses, even narratives, has since Proust's famous rendition of the Madeleine uh, dunk in hot tea found a powerful metaphor that allows us to physically feel not only the sensory experience of an involuntary memory from a withdrawn past, but also grasp the enormity of the narrative triggered by it. And here I will talk not only about those narratives that are spelled out and talked, uh, but also focus in particular on the power or the experience that is emotionally felt as an embodied state, often a, a physiological one. So um, we are here, uh, the, the objects that we are going to uh, look at comes from uh, Ravensbrück uh, and the origin of the collection um, is, is quite dramatic as well. The Museum Kulturen in Lund in Sweden houses a unique collection of small items made, kept and curated at Ravensbrück, which was established as a forced labor camp in 1939 in a small village 90 kilometers north of Berlin during the period of operation from 1939 to 1945, an estimated 130,000 women from across Europe are sent there. And while established as a working camp, uh, mainly for political prisoners, the conditions worsened over time, and toward the end of the World War II, Ravensbrück itself was used as an extermination camp. In each period of its use, though, conditions were extremely hard, and the majority of the prisoners died of disease, exhaustion, starvation, or in the gas chambers that were built in the vicinity of the camp. So only about 15,000 of the women survived until the liberation in 1945. And at the end of the war, 6,815 prisoners were handed over to the Danish and Swedish Red Cross, and 2,755 of these were carried by the white buses and nine, uh, or 3,960 by train. And as these women arrived at the port of Malmö in southern Sweden, they carried with them not only their clothes, uh, but uh, also uh, managed to bring small items and documents hidden in their garments. These artifacts make up a unique collection of Kultura with a complementary archive of books house, and diaries housed at the University Library in Lund. So the items range from everyday small tools, such as scissors, <clears throat> embroidered camp badges, like these ones here, rosaries, scraps of paper filled with text, collected and saved by, they were collected and saved by the Polish art historian, Sigmund Lakuszynski, who also interviewed several of the owners about the role of these materials uh, inside of the camp. So the result, <coughs> is a unique collection uh, of the material culture of resistance and resilience in the face of socio-materially and ideologically utterly a, a brutal world. We have hidden photos, we have uh, art, realistic renditions of camp life, and uh, also uh, cartoon uh, uh, or, or cartoons of this kind of uh, escapist, uh, maybe cynical or hopeful art of uh, the the New Year is Eve celebration in 1945. So the Robbins Cooper collection documents the active embodied creation of moments of refuge, uh, refuge from abject circumstances. The prisoners uh, embodied interactions with these material objects were intimately in intertwined with their own effective transformations, which in turn were part of the recursive creation, curation and modification of embodied emotional narratives. The effective transformation and its iconic representation in memory links present emotional experiences with both memories of the past and the extrasomatic environment, potentially allowing individual agents to create their own humanity 
even in such extreme circumstances. Latushinsky's interview with the Ravensbrück survivors testified to how important the embodied emotional narratives triggered by these objects of past lives must have been in mediating agency, in creating actions, feelings, memories, and narratives of hope. Effective engagement, memory, and the material environment interacted to construct strategic acts for survival and the assertion of personhood for the women who used, made, and shared these items. Thus, these powerful artifacts become examples of how material culture works with both bodily affective dynamics to resist the dominating structures of dehumanization, such as those defining a place like Ravensbrück. The women's words reveal that the processes involved in making and using the small items uh, and material traces of their past and potential future, future really included these uh, in, uh, changed embodied states as they remembered images or, uh, and, and, and kind of engaged with these materials in a uh, sensory motor uh, uh, process. And uh, I will show you later uh, some examples of, of how this uh, was, was uh, narrated by the women in the interviews. So what I'm after here is to focus on these bodily changes in effective states that were actively sought and often successfully achieved. The, manipula the manipulation of the objects often led to a highly selected perceptual attention involving uh, blindness to many threatening and concerning features in the immediate surroundings. At the same time, this created a conscious introspective focus on a past and on a future. As prisoners, bodily, uh, actively and, eff and effectively recreated connections to a better past before arrest and internment. Their sensory motor interactions with these small items sustained a feedback and constructed the manipulator's sense of humanity and self. So these objects are characterized by their discreet and illicit nature. Uh, they were also fundamentally threatened and also charged to a point of landing their possessor in trouble that could threaten their lives. They were therefore hidden and shared in confidence and at great risk, allowing them to metamorphose into metaphors, not only of past narratives, but also of social relations in the moment. So as we will see, um, the fate of these items was, was to be destroyed and, and forgotten and hidden, um, but they were preserved through human deliberate action. First as an act of resistance, as they were kept and created and traded, traded and then as an act of preservation of, of evidence for war crimes by uh, Lakoshinsky himself. And today they are kept in the University Library in Lund, and uh, some of them are exhibited at Kulturen in Lund, allowing them yet again to metamorphose into evidence of past atrocities available to become triggered, but with most of their transformative power lying dormant behind the glass of the exhibition case. So in the interviews with the survivors, we catch a glimpse of the ways in which these traces of past lives and threatened humanity operated inside the camp. Some prisoners uh, describe the embodied technological engagement with the material remains as therapeutical escapism when they were producing them. And here are a couple of examples of that. Um, when I sat fiddling with the tiny things like making dogs and cats, I was totally relaxed in my body and breathed normally. Then I was together with my father and my brother again. The same informant Inger stated, busying myself with things made me feel like a human being. It wasn't all just slaps and blows and shouting. So telling a story about the theme of escapism involved <clears throat> emotionally hopeful memory making. Notably, it also simultaneously involved material cultural production to make these iconic, extrasomatic, durable representations of, for example, domestic pets or dolls. And that the spreading of awareness in one's body as an intentional object, simply in the act of sitting still and experiencing autonomic rhythmic functions and the bodily sense of having temporarily escaped the slaps and blows and shouting and a very general indexical symbol of the term <coughs> human being pointing toward a self that can carry out unreflected routine practices as one did in the past with family members from whom one has been involuntarily and probably also violently separated and maybe something that we could do in the future. Erasing the past was part of the totalitarian strategy of dehumanizing the prisoners, as was the uh, uh, attempt to, to uh, erase any kind of hope for, for the future. 
So the exhibition describes how some women counteracted the daily oppressions by employing um, these strategies or effectively mediating uh, these introspective uh, moments as they were engaging with these objects. So they simply used this to remember actively uh, descriptive details. For example, the map that you saw earlier that would have been uh, an active recalling of a past. So through the recall of these memories, it becomes possible to imagine that there would also be a time after the camp. So here we have uh, another, we have this map, Inger stating, thinking about the past was a way to escape. It took pleasure, it took pleasure in the fact that the Nazis didn't know that I could hide in my memory. They couldn't take the delight in the memories away from me. Memories of mundane, otherwise forgettable details now become associated with a pleasurable, emotion-laden, embodied states. So these strategies of recall and memorization were, the, were then uh, externalized through the production of these material, powerful objects. Scraps of paper were used to materialize memories through writing of texts or mapping. Uh, sometimes there's like uh, long descriptive recipes of desserts, for example. Or, draw, uh, or these maps of the landscapes left behind. So in the materiality, these actively constructed memory become more real and uh, become tools for self-definition. The production of the objects in an environment of extreme scarcity relied on the ability to steal uh, and uh, steal materials from the camp uh, that came in and, and steal materials from new prisoners mm -hmm. that came in and who, whose things were taken from them. And the prisoners themselves refer to this as organizing, borrowing a term that symbolized resistance rather than illegality. Uh, one of the interviewees, Apollonia, stated, you were always on the lookout for something that you could use to make something with. The constant, effectively engaged, vigilant search for raw materials under conditions of armed surveillance or in the presence of other prisoners with similar interests would have structured everyday life. So the illicit engagement with material resources allocated for camp production, military uniforms, for example, and other clothing products became a strategy for protecting one's humanity. The focus of getting away with taking scraps also resulted in an everyday routine involving extended bouts of heightened effects, likely associated with emotional extremes of fear and excitement. The use of these small items produced or recovered could enter into the realm of active but discrete resistance. The interviews mention a group of women who made a point to each week look for a small item that they could use to embellish themselves on Saturdays. It could be a simple string to tie in their hair or a pin found somewhere. And the use of this material items was then a strategy to prevent the Germans from breaking their spirit, which is a part of um, lifted a quote from the interview. So this technologically restrained strategy of redefining the body became semiotically marked against a wider environment, forcing near total deprivation of agency and individuality. It's easy to imagine how the weekly task gave the participants a symbolic focus, which mediated and was sustained by their effective engagement. They were able to create their own community through ritual provisioning and performance on a small societal scale and under the poorest of circumstances. We note that from an interdisciplinary perspective, affect is fully relevant in a twofold meaning and pronunciation of the word. The strategies of manipulating the material world depend on sustained effective transformation, creating a positive emotional state, constituting a sense of sense, worth, resistance, and even pride. Yet the strategies as neuromotor gestures, interacting with sensory tangible material things, also affect the body in complex ways, affording the necessary sustained effective engagement. Objects were also exchanged and circulated to form and maintain ties between prisoners. Drawings and small pieces of embroidery were common as birthday gifts. Uh, in her memoir about imprisonment at Ravensbrück, um, De Gauss Antonios describes how several women would pull breadcrumbs together and knead into a small cake with a bit of jelly. The interviews indicate that gift giving was a significant practice for community building within the camp, an account that differs from the more sordid narrative by Primo Levi from Auschwitz. Levi uh, described loneliness as a fundamental experience of Auschwitz, where every other individual was a potential thief, threat, or enemy. 
The women in Ravensbrück told how they created and maintained a social world through picked material theft from the Nazi guard, followed by secret, uh, secret production and exchange. So we emphasize that the effective transformations involved in material exchange likely train selective attention on self and others in the immediate environment, who is a potential partner in this illicit economy. Uh, and in the conditions uh, in Ravensbrück, a material transaction, even the smallest token, would never be routine. Rather, the emotional reverberance would likely have been sustained and intense. The joint effective transformation of giver and receiver, perhaps amplified if witnessed in a small group, would have been difficult to hide. If such an illicit gift economy could be established, it would have reinforced the shared maintenance of embodied and episodic memories from the diverse prisoners' past lives. The given and received objects that were part of this embodied memory triggering process made the pasts with all the humanity and personhood it contained for the prisoners more tangible and accessible. If we bring an economic anthropological perspective to the inactivist effect focused approach to embodied action and experience, material gifts may be seen as extrasomatic affordances of exchanging these episodic embodied narratives. The Ravensbrück collection at Kulturen shows how artifact-mediated uh, exchange supported a politically daring economy of humanity production. So in this paper, I have wanted to focus <coughs> on the power residing in the intentional and explicit production of material culture and art as acts of resistance and humanity production in extreme circumstances. Here, the object is not a permanent presence to become activated by interpretation or will engagement, but rather an actively pr uh, produced materiality, always charged and active, almost magic in its power to affect change in bodily and psychological states of those producing and handling them, revealing an additional dimension to the concept of powerful artifacts that perhaps is only truly activated in extreme circumstances. Thank you. <laughs>